All right. For this next video presentation, I want to talk about connective tissue, the connective tissues of the body. And again, I will be using a lot of images from this uh, particular website that I mentioned in the first histology video. And I can't say this enough. I encourage you folks to go to this site and watch it. It is extremely or watch it. Look at the images on there. It is extremely useful, and I mean these are really well done you know, well taken images. So take a look at these. There's lots of different examples on here. Um, all right. So now on that note, let's kind of start talking about connective tissue. Now before I start getting into talking about the various connective tissues, remember that in the first presentation I discussed basically how you understand histology. Because remember, histology is the study of tissues underneath the microscope, all right? And in order to differentiate between the various tissues, you have to pay attention to a couple of different things. One, you have to pay attention to the cellular composition, okay? You have to pay attention to basically what are the shapes of the cells, okay? The spacing in between the cells, all right? You have to pay attention to, I mean, you know, the amount of the cells, Okay, you have to look at all aspects of the cells that you can, okay, you know, in order to understand what this tissue is composed of. Because remember that life is all about the sum of all activity at the cellular level. And so if you see, if you're looking at a, a sample tissue under the microscope and you see a bunch of, you know, you see a bunch of nerve cells, you're going to think, well, that's nervous tissue. This is used for, you know, some kind of monitoring, communication, whatever purposes, all right? You know, if you're looking at a sample of liver, you know, liver tissue, you're going to see, you know, these more octagon kind of shaped cells, hepatocytes. If you're looking at epithelial cells, you're going to see, remember we talked about epithelial tissue in the last presentation as a covering type tissue, all right? And in order to make a proper covering, you're going to see a bunch of cells that are very, very tightly packed together, okay? Either in one singular layer that we would call simple epithelia or multiple layers that we would call stratified epithelia. Okay, so make sure you're paying attention to that, the cellular composition. All right, make sure you are paying attention to the extracellular matrix. Okay, the basically all the non-living material found outside of the cells. Okay, you know, what are the various proteins? Okay, you know, within the extracellular matrix. What is the ground substance that is formed? Okay, basically what we're saying here is when you take all the proteins and all the other stuff and mix them in water, what, it, what do you form? Do you form some kind of a gel? Do you form some kind of a hardened mineral substance? Is it very fluid? Okay, you know, is it an extremely sticky substance? All right, so make sure you pay attention to this stuff because especially, I mean, it goes with any part of histology, but when it comes to connective tissues, this is really big, okay? This is, you know, it's really important because there are some connective tissues that are very similar. For example, cartilage. Cartilage is essentially made up of the same three types of cells, but you have to tell the difference between them by paying attention, you know, between the three different types of cartilages by looking at, you know, the extracellular matrix, where are the various protein fibers that are found with there, you know, within there, how is the ground substance and so on, okay? So keep that in mind when you're, you know, when, when you're looking at any tissue and especially this connective tissue stuff, just these basic characteristics of histology, all right? Now, essentially, when we're talking about connective tissues, connective tissues are fairly easy to, well, Connective tissues are fairly easy to understand. I mean, one, think of the name. You know, think of the name. These are connecting type tissues, okay? And in order for the, you know, so what we're saying here is these are, these are, this is a binding type tissue. Connective tissue has to be sticky, okay? Connective tissue has to be a sticky type of a tissue, all right? Hence the term. Now, when you see CT, that's the common abbreviation for connective tissue. All right, and in order for them to be sticky, there has to be a lot of, you know, there's a lot of proteins within the extracellular matrix, okay? And as a result, when you take these proteins and you mix them in water, you form this gel, you form this gel ground substance, all right? And, oops, sorry. And as a result, when you form this gel-like ground substance, you now form a sticky tissue, all right? And how sticky the tissue is depends on how much and what types of proteins are mixed within the extracellular matrix, all right? 
So keep that in mind that that's essentially what connected tissues are. It's just it's just cells and proteins and water mixed together to form these you know these sticky gels, gels and fibers. All right. So then in saying that, as we kind of work our way down through the connective tissues, um, you have to understand the the some of the common fibers or proteins that you find within the extracellular matrix of these tissues. Okay. And the two most common ones that you're going to encounter um, are going to be collagen and what we call elastin. Okay. Collagen and elastin. All right. Now, when we're talking about collagen and elastin, collagen is a very, very, it's, it's a, it's, it, think of collagen as a structural protein. It's a strong protein, structural protein. Okay. Now, in saying that, collagen has a, has a very high what we call tensile force. Okay, it can resist pulling and stretching very well. All right, it can resist pulling and stretching very well. So collagen is a very good fiber to have in certain areas of the body where there's a lot of force put on them. For example, tendons and ligaments. All right, when you when you take a tissue sample of a tendon or a ligament and you look at you know you look at that tissue under the microscope, all you're going to see is a lot of densely packed collagen fibers. Okay, very very densely packed collagen fibers. And you'll see a nucleus of a cell here and there. All right. And as a result, that tendon and ligament is going to be very, very resistant to pulling forces. All right. If you take a, a tissue like fibrocartilage, okay, and you pack enough collagen in there, that's going to become very, very, it's going to become a very dense, hard, tough type of cartilage. And it's going to be able to withstand, you know, the, the, the compression forces that may be put on them. Okay. It's going to be like a, think of it as like a very tough rubber. Okay, so and collagen is actually the most abundant protein in the human body, makes up about 25% of all the proteins in our body. All right, you know, and you know, it, it's found in more than just tendons and ligaments and fibrocartilage. I mean, the sclera, the white of your eye, is composed of cartilage. All right, there's some, or cartilage, I'm sorry, the, the white of your eye is composed of. Um, you know, collagen. You know, there's collagen in your, there's collagen fibers in your skin. There's collagen fibers in your bone. There's collagen fibers all over the place. Okay, and by having these collagen fibers in many in many areas of the body, that give you know that gives strength to these areas where you find collagen. Okay, it's just that there are some areas that have more collagen, so as a result, they're typically more you know they're stronger tissues. Okay. So then another common type of fiber that you're going to find, protein fiber you're going to find in the extracellular matrix is elastin. Okay, and elastin is about the exact opposite of collagen. Okay, elastin is a very elastic type protein. Okay, and when you take a look at elastin, essentially you're going to find this in very flexible areas of the body. There will be some in the skin, there's some in the muscle, there's a lot in, in areas of your body that we call um, elastic cartilage, okay, like your ears, for example, as you're listening to this, I'm talking right now, I mean, you know, take your ear and bend and twist it, okay, just don't do too hard, just don't do it too hard, please, um, but, you know, the, the flexibility of your ear comes from, uh, you know, the high amount of elastic fibers within the matrix of that tissue, all right, of that elastic cartilage, all right, now, when you look at, now, when you look at these tissues under a microscope, for example, when you're looking at elastic cartilage, what you're going to see is you're going to see the chondrocytes, the cartilage cells, all right, and then the elastin fibers are going to be very, very long, okay? They're very long. They're very stringy-like in appearance, okay? Whereas when you're looking at collagen, collagen is going to look, you know, it's going to look a lot more thick, a lot more dense, okay, you know, which gives, you know, which allows it to be a more structural type protein, all right? So, so keep that in mind as well. Collagen fibers are going to look bigger and thicker. Elastic fibers are going to look longer and thinner. All right. And then the other, uh, the other type of protein fiber that I'm going to mention is reticular, um, reticular fibers. And you're going to primarily find this in a type of connective tissue that we call, coincidentally, reticular connective tissue. All right. And I'll talk more about reticular connective tissue in a little bit, but reticular connective tissue is, reticular fibers, I should say, are short branched fibers, and um, reticular connective tissue you find is forming frameworks of certain areas of the body, all right? And I'll talk more about that in a little bit. So pay attention to those fibers that are within, um, 
within, I wasn't going to say, within the connective tissues. Collagen, elastin, or reticular tissues, or reticular fibers. Now, the connective tissue um, also has a wide variety of cells. You know, connective tissue, you have to bear in mind, is the most variable tissue you're going to find within the human body. Okay, there's a lot of variety that goes with this. Part of it's because of, you know, a, a big part of this is because of all the different cells that you can find within connective tissue. All right. Now, essentially, within the, the tissues that we call connective tissue proper, which I'll talk about in a little bit, okay, or the supportive connective tissues, there are, there are cells that are very mitotically active, meaning, you know, cells that are, you know, constantly dividing. All right. So, essentially, when we're developing connective tissues, we have these cells that we call blasts. All right, and what these blasts are doing is they're 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 synthesizing the, the the proteins that you find within the extracellular matrix, and they're excreting these proteins. All right, and then what's going to happen is as they continue release the continually release these proteins out into the extracellular matrix. Remember what I mentioned earlier: when you start taking these proteins and mixing them in water, you're going to form a gel like ground substance around the cell. All right. And then when this cell becomes embedded within the gel, it's not going to, it's really not going to, you know, can you know, secrete proteins like it did when it was younger. So then it's just going to become more of a functional cell of that tissue. And then we would call that a site. For example, cartilage. We would call a cartilage cell a chondroblast early on, okay, because as we're developing cartilage, you know, this chondroblast is going to be continuously secreting the proteins out into the matrix, and then eventually that cell is going to become embedded within the gel of that tissue, and then it's just going to become a chondroblast, and, you know, just a, like I said, just a regular functioning cell of that. So keep that in mind when you see blast or site, because you'll see chondroblast, chondrocyte, osteoblast, osteocyte, and so on. Okay. So basically, within the connective tissue propers, we call these cells fibroblasts because they're, you know, fibroblasts are continuously secreting the elastic fibers, the collagen fibers, okay, and so on. Um, you know, in cartilage, I just mentioned this, you know, osteoblasts and osteocytes, okay, and bone marrow, we would call these hematopoietic stem cells, okay, hemato, remember some medical terminology review, blood. Think of poiesis as a process of making or synthesizing or creating, okay? So basically there are these stem cells within bone marrow that eventually differentiate into mature, you know, red blood cells, white blood cells, or what are called megakaryocytes that produce platelets, all right? Other, and then there are other cells, um, very common cells that you find within connective tissue. There are fat cells that we call adipocytes. Okay, there are leukocytes, there are red blood cells and urethrocytes, there are, and there are also cells that we call mast cells and macrophages. All right, essentially what mast cells and macrophages are, mast cells are cells that basically store histamine, okay? And essentially what happens then, for example, if you cut your skin and damage your skin, you know, wherever may be, or you come in contact with an allergen, these are going to release hist these cells are going to be stimulated to release histamine, and then that will stimulate an inflammatory uh, that'll help enhance and then stimulate an inflammatory response. Okay, I mean that's all. I mean essentially an allergic reaction is an inflammation of sorts. Okay, some people just have them worse than others. Histamine has more effects than that. Um, more effects than just, you know, promoting inflammation. You know, histamine in the, in the airways can cause the constriction of your bronchioles and then you won't be able to breathe. That's why, you know, people that have allergies need to carry an inhaler or an EpiPen of sorts, okay? Um, and then macrophages are phagocytes that you find embedded within the, within the, the matrix of the tissues, all right? And these phagocytes, basically, they'll consume old, you know, old used up proteins. They'll consume, you know, dead cells, cellular debris, anything that's infecting us. Macrophages just keep the tissues clean, all right? You may find cells that are used to produce antibodies, plasma cells, all right? And 
you know, and these, these antibodies will be excreted into our body tissue compartments to help fight infections, okay? But like I said, the, the high variability of connective tissue just comes from the wide variety of cells that you can find within these connective tissues, all right? So, and I'll, and I'll be bringing these cells up again as I'm going through each specific connective tissue. All right, so as a result then, after talking about some of the basic properties of connective tissues and now the cells of connective tissue, this is another reason why we say that connective tissue is the most highly variable in the body because of the wide array of functions. Okay, I mean, primarily you think of connective tissue as binding and support. Okay, because like we said, I mean, if there's one thing you want to remember about connective tissue is that it is sticky. All right, you know, you take these proteins, mix them in water, and you form these gels and connective tissue is very, very sticky, all right? And connective tissue offers us some protection, all right? It offers us some protection. You remember, you know, we just mentioned, we just mentioned white blood cells and so on. We mentioned blood cells, okay? Remember, white blood cells are essentially your immune system, okay? And, so, and as a result, this helps protect. You know your immune system is there to help prevent and, you know, prevent and fight off infections, all right? Adipose tissue can help um, protect us because you know fat can be a cushioning type tissue and that could help us you know if we fall from a high place someone hits us or whatnot okay that could cushion trauma that could potentially hurt our internal organs all right mineral storage you saw in the previous slide that osteoblasts and osteocytes were on there remember osteo means bone Okay, so as a result, bone is a connective tissue, and I'll talk about why when we get to that area. Okay, but, you know, there's a lot of minerals that we store within bone. All right, insulation, that's where the adipose comes in again. Okay, when it comes to heat, um, fat is very, very good at insulating heat. It's just not very good at generating heat. Okay, whereas muscle tissue, on the other hand, muscle is very good at generating heat, but is not as good of an insulator as adipose tissue. Okay, so adipose can act as insulation. And adipose is also going to be where you find the energy storage taking place. All right. You know, I mean, this is where we store, I mean, a, a, a very large portion of calories in our system, you know, for future use. Because you have to remember, we are animals. And as a result, we are animals that need to survive, you know, hard situations, you know, when there, when there is not a lot of food available. And we do this by storing calories so we can continue to fuel our metabolism when we can't eat as much. Okay, and that's why people always say if you, if you really want to trim down the, the amount of body fat um, that you have for, you know, you should be doing it for health reasons, not just aesthetic reasons. But, you know, if you want to, if you want to get your body fat levels down, you, that's why you're supposed to cut calories, okay? And if you exercise and do it right, you will burn more calories at, during exercise and at rest. And you lower the amount of calories you burn through your, whoa, you burn through your fat stores. All right. So that's why, you know, that's essentially in a the very basic version of how that works. All right. Transportation. Okay. Remember, blood. Blood is technically a connective tissue. And I'll talk about why in a, in, in, when we get to that area. But being that blood is in the connective tissue category, you know, you know that blood is how we circulate things around the body. It's how we circulate hormones from endocrine glands to target tissues. It's how we circulate uh, oxygen from our lungs to our peripheral tissues, carbon dioxide from our peripheral tissues to our lungs, and so on. Okay, you know, so we, this is how blood is transport. Immunity, as I just mentioned, lots of functions to this tissue. All right, and on that note, let's actually start jumping in and talking about the different types of connective tissues out there. All right, now first what I want to mention is connective tissue proper. All right, connective tissue proper, we call it connective tissue proper because it has a wide array of cells and proteins. Okay, the very, very diverse array of cells and proteins um, within its composition. All right, and we can divide connective tissue proper into two types loose connective tissue and dense connective tissue, all right? Then we call, basically, we call them loose or dense based on what they look like under the microscope, okay? When you look at loose connective tissue, you see a very loose arrangement of the cells and fibers, um, you know, under the slide, all right? You're not going to see a lot of very densely packed 
tissues, it's going to look very unorganized. All right, whereas when you look at dense connective tissue, you're going to see a lot more dense arrangement of the cells and the fibers within that tissue. Okay, so keep that in mind when, you're, when we're talking about this connective tissue proper. All right, the loose connective tissue and dense connective tissue. So first, let's start talking about loose connective tissue. And, you know, one of the more abundant types of connective tissue in the body in general is what we call areolar connective tissue. All right, areolar connective tissue. This tissue is everywhere. Okay, this tissue is underneath your skin. Okay, it's, w it's within the dermis of your skin. Actually, I shouldn't say it's underneath. It's actually within your skin, okay? The middle layer of your skin is primarily composed of areolar connective tissue with some reticular mixed in there, all right? Um, you know, this is in between muscles. Okay, this is in your lungs, okay, within the bronchiolar circulation. I mean, this tissue is all over the place, okay? Essentially, wherever there is space that needs to be filled, you're going to find areolar connective tissue, Okay, so you have to remember that within the human body, there is no space that goes unfilled. That's another, that's kind of another characteristic of, I don't want to necessarily say a function, but a characteristic of connective tissue that you see is that it is a space filler within the body. Okay, so essentially where there, and you find this almost everywhere, wherever there, again, wherever there's a space that needs to be filled in between muscle cells, in, you know, within the lungs, within your skin, okay, there is going to be a real connective tissue. All right, now in the last video, I also talked about epithelial tissue, all right, and I mentioned that epithelial tissue, the cells of epithelial tissue are very, very densely packed. Okay, remember that epithelial cells are so tightly packed together that there's really no room for blood vessels or nerves. Okay, there's really no room for blood vessels or nerves. All right, and remember that epithelial tissues, whether it's simple or stratified, are ground to a, this gel like substance that we call the basement membrane. All right, and directly underneath the basement membrane, that's where you find the blood vessels that supply and nourish the cells of epithelial tissue. And remember that these that these um, that directly underneath the basement membrane is always going to be this loose areolar connective tissue. Okay, areolar connective tissue. Okay, now that's the beauty of areolar connective tissue is that this is such a widely spaced tissue that it allows for, it allows basically for room for growth. Okay, now as you take a look at this, you can see, you know, you see these kind of stringy looking fibers there. Those are elastic fibers. Okay, you see these thicker red looking fibers, that's collagen. And here you can see that this is the nucleus of the fibroblasts, the cells that, that, that produce and secrete these proteins into the extracellular matrix, okay? And then you'll also notice that there's a lot of space, okay? There is space in between these fibers, okay? So as a result, being that there's space in between these fibers, that's space where a blood vessel can grow. That's space where a nerve can can bud and protrude through that space where you can you can put an, a receptor for the nervous system that space where an exocrine gland can uh, for the duct of an exocrine gland to pass through okay that's the beauty of a real connected tissue is it's not only so abundant it allows us to function okay so it's a it's a highly spaced tissue where you find blood vessels and nerves and other structures depending on the area of the body for growth this is where we can find other cells as well Okay, because for example, when you look at the bronchioles of the lungs, all right, let's say you come in contact with, uh, let's say you're allergic to cats, all right, you're allergic to the dander in cats, all right, and you start, you, know, you, you, you go to, let's say you, you meet a new friend, you go over to their house, and you start hanging out, and you didn't know that that person had a cat, all right, and you know, remember in the spaces in between the bronchial, you know, the, the bronchioles, the tissue spaces of the lungs, there's going to be some areolar connected tissue. And then sitting within there, there will be sitting embedded within that tissue, kind of outside of your bronchioles, there are going to be mast cells. Okay, there will be some mast cells. All right, so now you're breathing in that animal dander, you're allergic to the cat, now these mast cells are going to release histamine. 
Okay, this is a, you know, and then as a result, your bronchioles are going to constrict and you're not going to be able to breathe. Okay, so there's room for cells in here. There are phagocytes in here. These antibody, other antibody producing cells, you know, B cells and plasma cells and so on. All right, so this tissue is all over the place. All right, so that's irregular connective tissue. A very, very abundant type of connective tissue. All right, and here's an example. Here's an image from the website that I pulled up. And again, you can see the very, very loose arrangement of the, you know, again, of these, of this tissue. You know, you can see all the stringy proteins. You can see kind of the thicker areas. And again, you can see how there could be room for blood vessels to form, for nerves to uh, pass through this tissue and so on. Okay, so that's irregular connective tissue. It's a very, very spacey type of tissue, all right? Next is reticular connective tissue. And reticular connective tissue, um, definitely the most common area that you're going to find reticular connective tissue is going to be within lymphatic tissue, okay? Okay, we would say that reticular connective tissue forms the framework for lymph organs. Okay, think of reticular, I mean reticular connective tissue is in other places of the body as well. As I mentioned before, you will find some reticular connective tissue within the skin as well as other areas. But definitely this is a tissue you're going to see a lot when you're learning about the lymphatic system and you're learning about all the various structures that make up the lymphatic system, such as lymph nodes, the thymus gland, your tonsils, uh, various patches around the body, you know, like uh, Peyer's patches found within the intestinal tract and so on, all right? The, the, the spleen, this is what, that's what you see pictured here, all right? So think so. I definitely, for the sake of this class, I want you to primarily think of reticular connective tissue as forming the framework for lymphatic organs. Now, as I mentioned earlier, reticular fibers are basically are, are basically very widely spaced, short and branched collagen fibers. Okay, so reticular connective tissue is a very very spaced tissue. There's a lot of space in between the fibers of this tissue. And the beauty of that is in understanding essentially what, what the organs of the lymphatic system do. Whether you're talking about a lymph node, whether you're talking about the spleen, whether you're talking about the thymus gland or tonsils, these are those patches, they're you know, lymph nodules essentially. What all of these have in common is that these are very densely packed with cells, especially white blood cells, all right? White blood cells and fluids, okay? So that's the beauty of having all of this space in between these reticular fibers is there's room for white blood cells, okay? So as you have this, this clear colorless fluid called lymph circulating through a lymph node, you know, and you're carrying around a, a, an antigen from a bacteria or a virus, and that, and that circulates within a lymph node, now all these white blood cells can start to attack that, that foreign antigen, all right? The, so essentially that's what lymph nodes do. They filter this fluid that we call lymph. Your, your spleen filters blood, all right, because, you know, it's primarily blood flow going into here. You know, your, your, your tonsils filter essentially whatever you eat and breathe, okay? Patches filter whatever is flowing through the GI tract, those Peyer's patches that I mentioned. All right, so that's the beauty of reticular connective tissue and the spacing of it is lots of white blood cells in here, and these are essentially organs that help defend us from foreign pathogens. So that's, that's really how I want you to think of reticular connective tissue, forming the framework for your lymphatic organs. And here's another image of it right here. Again, you can see the very loose arrangement of the reticular fibers, and then you can see where there are cells all over the place in between the spaces of these fibers, okay? So that's reticular connective tissue. Now let's move on to adipose tissue. All right, adipose tissue, if there's any tissue in the body that's the easiest to identify, it's adipose, okay? And adipose tissue is, comp is comprised of cells that we call adipocytes. Okay, adipocytes, all right. Now, adipocytes, these are just, this is essentially a storage tissue. The primary function of, adip of adipose tissue is to store calories. 
Okay, calories in the form of triglycerides. Okay, essentially what a triglyceride is, it's a two-part fat. It's a fat that has a what's, what's called a glycerol head and then three fatty acid chains attached to it. Remember, when we're talking about the basic component of a lipid, remember, fats are just, as I mentioned a, a while ago in another video, fats are just long hydrocarbon chains. Okay, so they're strings of carbon with hydrogens attached to them. Okay, and you know, again, lots of calories here. Okay, that's essentially what these fatty acid tails look like. And then the glycerol heads are, are chemically a little different, but I don't need to. I don't want to go too far off topic with this. Okay, so so basically, what we do then, what these adipocytes do, is they store all this ad, they store all this fat in here. So essentially, all this white that you see within this adipocyte. That's all fat. It's basically oil. All right. So all this fat gets inside here. This is just like one big oil droplet. Okay. And then as a result, you use you just you save that for later. All right. So again, if you're in a situation where you need to, I mean, you primarily burn fat on a day-to-day -day basis to fuel your metabolism. But if you're starving your body, you know, for dietary reasons or for religious reasons, you know, for fasting or you're just you know, starving in general, um, you know, there are, there are enzymes in here that are going to break apart, um, you know, this triglyceride is going to, you know, will break off these fatty acid tails, we'll circulate these in the blood to our muscles and other organs that need them, and then we can use this glycerol head as, you know, for carbohydrate metabolism, all right, and, you know, that's how we use these cells, all right, they're just oil droplets that we burn later when we need them. All right. Now, again, these are easy to identify. I mean, look at them. I mean, they look like ping pong balls underneath the microscope. All right. So basically what you're seeing is just a huge drop of oil. And then you notice that, that within all these adipocytes, there's a dark spot on the periphery of these cells. OK, that's the nucleus of the cell. All right. That's actually the nucleus of the cell. So if we take a look here. So right here, this is this is a good one. All right, that's the nucleus. So now the nucleus is on the periphery of the cell just because there's so much oil, there's so much fat within the, within the cell itself, it pushes, the nucleus is pushed against the plasma, the plasma membrane of these adipocytes. All right, and so, so all you're looking at is, is essentially a white cell with a nucleus. And, you know, you, you don't really see, you know, any other organelles that would be within the cell would also be shoved against the plasma membrane. All right, so that's why these are so easy to identify. Now, when you take a look at these adipocytes, you know, when you take a look at images, uh, let's go to the next one. You can kind of see on this picture, there is no real specific arrangement to adipocytes, to, to, the, to these uh, fat cells of, of the body. They're just stacked all over the place, okay? You see there's no really, you know, unique arrangement of them. It's just wherever there's room, wherever there's room, they just stack all together. All right, so that's essentially adipose tissue. Um, and again, adipose tissue, you know, as I mentioned, the primary function is, you know, the storage of calories, but we can also use this as a thermal insulator and also as a cushioning protective uh, type tissue as well. But those are secondary functions, all right? You know, the cushioning comes from, you know, essentially you have all these fat, you know, oily cells piled on top of each other, you develop kind of a, 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 a cushy tissue, all right? It's soft, but it can also withstand some force, all right? The thermal insulation, again, you have all these very fatty cells stacked together. You can develop, you can make a pretty thick type of a tissue, and as a result, you know, that can help shield heat or hold heat within the body, all right? And this is what we would call white fat, okay? When you take a look at this, you know, in the previous two that I just looked at as well, this is white fat. I mean, obviously, you can see why it's called white fat, because what does it look like? It's white, okay? And that's the primary type of adipose that you find in the body. And there's another type of fat out there that's called brown fat, okay? When we're first, when we're first born, we do, have, we do have a decent amount of brown fat within us, but as adults, we more or less get rid of our brown fat and we call brown fat brown because well it looks more brown underneath the microscope it looks like that because brown fat has a lot of mitochondria within it remember mitochondria 
are the powerhouses of the cell. These are the ATP, you know, where we, where we, you know, through aerobic metabolism, where we uh, develop the bulk of the ATP for the cell. All right, you know, the energy for the cells. All right, now basically. Animals that utilize brown fat would be animals, uh, for example, that hibernate, okay, like a, a bear. A bear is going to have a good amount of brown fat, okay, because hibernating animals, they sleep for, they don't sleep, they don't, you know, it, when we say hibernation, I mean, it depends on the animal we're talking about. Well, let's say we're talking about these big mammals, okay, like a, like a bear, for example. A bear just doesn't go to sleep at the beginning of winter and just sleep through the entire time. Okay, they're they're in a, a kind of a in between sleep and a comatose state. All right, but they'll a bear will get up in the middle of winter, walk around, go to the bathroom, maybe even give birth, and then just go back to sleep. All right, but essentially, like I said, they don't sleep entirely through. All right, but there are some animals that do, like certain reptiles, but they have that's a whole total, whole different physiology topic. So basically, when we say that these adipocytes have a lot of mitochondria in them, there's a lot of metabolism in these cells. And as a result, because of all the chemical reactions taking place, um, you know, because you got to remember when, when a bear is preparing for hibernation, they do nothing but eat and eat. And I mean, they live to eat. Okay. And they eat to live. All right. So they just continuously eat. They gorge themselves from the day they wake up till the day they have to hibernate, and they build up their and they build up their fat stores. All right. So then what happens is because of all this mito, you know, they, then then they hibernate. They don't really eat a whole lot. They burn through their fat stores throughout the winter time, and as a result, by having all this mitochondria within their brown fat as well they can generate a lot of heat because of all the extra metabolism and chemical reactions taking place. So brown fat's a type of fat that essentially is used to keep an animal warm. All right. And, you know, when we're younger, when we're first born and, you know, our nervous systems aren't fully developed yet, we haven't really been exposed to the outside world. Um, you know, our, our physiologies are still trying to figure out the natural world. Okay, we utilize some brown fat to keep us warm, but as adults, now that we can thermoregulate better, there really isn't much of a use for it. So in areas where there's a lot of brown fat, it more or less becomes white fat. Okay, so that's brown fat. This isn't something you're going to see in humans a lot, but more, like I said, think of hibernating animals. All right, so those, so those were the loose connective tissues of connective tissue proper. Now let's talk about dense, the dense connective tissues. And the, there's, a, there, there's a couple of these. And the first one that we're, we're going to talk about is dense, regular connective tissue. Dense, regular connective tissue. All right, now, there, you know, there, so you can probably think if there's a dense regular, there's going to be a dense irregular coming up next. Okay. And basically, we call them regular or irregular because of the arrangement of the cells and the fibers that make up, you know, that make up the composition of this tissue. Okay, so dense regular connective tissue is very uniform in its composition. Okay, it's a very linear type tissue. So what you're looking at here in this picture, this would be the nucleus of the of the fibroblast that, excuse, excuse me, that. Um, that produces this tissue and then all everything else what you see here this is basically all collagen okay this is very very this is a very densely packed array of collagen fibers okay now remember we said collagen is a tough structural protein okay so if you're looking at a tissue that has a lot of collagen within it you're going to think that this is a strong tissue that it has a very high tensile force very resistant to pulling forces all right and primary, and so when you think of dense regular connective tissue, you know you're going to think of tendons and ligaments. Okay, you're going to think of tendons and ligaments. Okay, the difference between a, you know between these, a tendon basically attaches muscle to bone. All right, and then ligaments attach bone to bone. Okay, so when you're so when you're taking a look at a muscle, all right, I'm actually going to show you an image of this when we get to the um, the 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 topic on muscle tissue. You'll have the you'll have a belly of a muscle, the contractile part. All right, and then you'll have basically tendons on on either side. All right, you know you'll have what's called an origin and an insertion, uh, a, a highly movable end and a not quite as movable end. 
All right, so now one thing to remember about muscles is that when a muscle contracts, this is a tissue that's designed to shorten, okay? And when this tissue shortens, it's going to pull on the tendon, all right? It's going to pull on the tendon. And then as we pull on the tendon, you know, you got to remember this tendon is going to, let's say, I don't know, let's say this is your humerus, and let's say this is your elbow. All right, so let's say so let's say this would be your arm, this would be your forearm. All right, and let's say we're looking at your bicep muscle here. So you got a tendon there and a tendon there. All right, now again, it's obviously not going to look exactly like this, but this is for the sake of discussion. So now what happens when this muscle contracts and it shortens, it's going to pull on this tendon, and then as a result, this tendon crossed the joint, so that's going to allow this joint to then move. It's going to allow you to curl your, you know, your, your, your forearm. You know, it's going to allow you to take your wrist and move it up towards your shoulder. All right. So what we call flexion of the elbow. All right. So since muscles are continuously pulling on these tendons, all right, we don't want to be ripping and separating and tearing these tendons. And, you know, it's because a lot of, in order for a mu you know, muscles can exert a lot of force and a contraction. All right. So keep that in mind. All right, and then ligaments, uh, you know, attach bones to the bones. So basically, you find ligaments within joints. All right, ligaments are within joints. All right, these make joints more secure. All right, because tendons alone crossing a joint is not enough. All right, so for example, you've heard of the ACL, the anterior cruciate ligament, or the MCL, the medial collateral ligament. All right, those are ligaments that are that are designed to basically make the knee more structurally stable. All right, so that's essentially what ligaments do is they just, you know, they, they make joints more stable. All right, and they allow muscles to carry out their actions because if you have a, you know, if you have a joint with the bones in place and the structural stability is in place, then muscles can allow for, you know, make movement happen. Okay, so that's dense regular connective tissue, and then the dense irregular connective tissue then would be, again, a very dense, uh, an area that's densely packed with collagen, except the arrangement is, well, irregular. Okay. Now, as you can see here, highlighted in, the, in this image, all right, this is what we would call a capsule. Okay, that's what we call a capsule. All right, now this is your shoulder, as you can deduce from this picture, and this is what we would call a synovial joint. Okay, I mean, I'll talk about joints later on, but a synovial joint is a very complex joint that's within the body. All right, and one characteristic you're going to learn about synovial joints is that these are encapsulated joints. There is some kind of tissue capsule that encloses all the structure of that joint, a synovial capsule, and as a res and and this capsule is composed of dense irregular connective tissue. All right, you know when you get into the when you start learning about the heart, okay, you're going to learn that the heart is surrounded by a sac called the pericardium. Okay, peri meaning around, cardium, you know, you know, heart. Okay, so a sac around the heart. All right, the pericardium is comprised of this dense, irregular connective tissue. So the beauty of this tissue is, you know, again, you have cells that are releasing high amounts of collagen into the matrix, forming these tough structural gels, these tough ground substances. So the beauty of the loose arrangement, or I should say not loose, but the irregular arrangement of this tissue is it allows these capsules to basically form around the organs, okay, because of the irregular arrangement of the proteins, all right, that allows these, these tissues to take on the shape of the organ itself, all right, because essentially around the, in the, you know, the internal organs of the body, you're going to find capsules surrounding them. All right. Whereas with dense regular connective tissue, it's more of a linear formation. All right. So basically with dense irregular, I'm sorry, with dense regular connective tissue, you can withstand the pulling and stretching forces that are applied to it, the tensile forces, okay, but the compressive forces not so well. Okay, whereas when you have this irregular arrangement of tissues all over the place, this can withstand force applied to it in all directions. All right, and like I said, it allows the tissue to conform to the shape of the organ. 
All right. So that's dense irregular connective tissue. Like I said, it's essentially the same thing as dense regular, except the collagen fibers are just, there's no real uniform arrangement to them. Now, like I said, the arrangement of the fibers are going to depend on the shape of the organ itself. All right. And here's an image of the dense irregular connective tissue. This is a transverse section of this. And you can see that there would be, these would be tissues that would look like they'd be projecting kind of in a three dimensional fashion out of the screen towards you. Again, I can't draw that. And then you can see that there are other um, fibers. So there's five, so there's collagen fibers going in all directions. All right. So that's dense irregular connective tissue. And then there's what's called dense elastic tissue. And realistically, you're going to find this within the arteries of the of the body. Now here we show the like, for example, this is the aorta, the biggest artery of the body. Okay. So the very big. Um, arteries of the body are going to are going to have this within the walls of them and the reason being is because as the left ventricle or the right ventricle is um is pumping blood yes eh, let's leave like right ventricle out of this i'm not going to talk let's not lump the pulmonary arteries in this um but but basically as the left ventricle is going to be squeezing blood out of itself okay it's what we would call systole um so basically, as blood is being pumped out of this, these that blood, you know, let's say here's your aorta, okay, that high volume of blood moving through here at a very high pressure is going to be putting a lot of force on the walls of this vessel. And this, the, the walls of this vessel are then going to be able to expand, and that's going to allow for nice, easy blood flow, okay? And the beauty of that is when the you know when the when the heart is relaxing and refilling then these walls can recoil back and then blood and that still promotes nice easy blood flow that's how we keep blood pressure down by having nice elastic arteries and that's why blood pressure does rise as we get older because you know because the elasticity of these of our arteries goes down the, you know the proteins in here tend to link together in a fashion that makes the that that um, makes the arteries more stiff and brings blood pressure up. Because if these arteries aren't able to flex or aren't able to, you know, be as rubbery as they used to be, that means, you know, the same volume of blood is going to have to flow through a more narrow space. That means how are we going to compensate for that? The heart's going to have to work harder to circulate that blood around the body. Hence, blood pressure will go up. Okay. Now let's talk about the word elastic for a second. When we say and when we say an object in elastic, it is able to recoil. Okay. When we say recoil, what we're saying here is if you apply pressure to an object that's elastic, it's going to stretch. Okay. It's going to stretch like a rubber band. All right. Or, or the artery in this situation. All right. And then what's going to happen when you relieve the pressure, when the pressure goes away, then the object will recoil, all right? Now, when we say recoil, think that the object is going to go back to its original shape, okay? The object's going to go back to its original shape, all right? That's what I mean when I say recoil. If you apply pressure to an object, it has the ability to stretch and then, and then go back to its original shape when the pressure is relieved from the object. All right, so those are the connective tissue propers that I, that I want to talk about. Now let's talk about a supportive type of tissue, uh, cartilage. And as I mentioned before, when it comes to understanding, um, when it comes to understanding the types of cartilage, you really have to pay attention to the extracellular matrix just because, you know, all three types of cartilage are composed of the same cells, chondrocytes. All right. So basically by telling these apart, we have to take a look at the, um, the matrix and the proteins within it. So hyaline cartilage, think of hyaline as like rubber. Okay, think of hyaline as just like a, a rubber. All right, so you've got these chondrocytes, and there's a there's a there's a good mix of collagen and elastin, and it's very dense. Okay, so collagen, or I'm sorry, so hyaline cartilage is rubbery, but it's also tough at the same time. It has some stretch to it. So when you take a look here, uh, these are what we call the costal cartilages. Okay, this costal cartilage is flexible, all right? So where our ribs articulate with our sternum, when I say articulate, I mean where another bone meets a, a bone, okay? On the anterior side of where our ribs make, 
make up our thoracic cage, it's not a bony articulation, it's cartilage on bone. Okay, so the beauty of this is that gives our rib cage flexibility. So when we want to inhale or breathe in, your rib cage can expand, and that also allows your lungs to expand. Okay, there's also hyaline cartilage that lines your trachea, or what we, you know, trachea is what we call layman speak, the windpipe. Okay, which makes the which makes the trachea nice and flexible. All right, and so on. So hyaline cartilage is a very rubbery type cartilage, and then this is what it would you know an image I pulled from the site. You can see the chondrocytes. These are very ovoid in shape. You know they look like an oops, look like an oval, and then you can see that there is uh, you know a good amount of, of collagen in here. Um, but now you're going to see what's uh, called uh, 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 fibrocartilage here in a second, and that's very, it's basically the same thing as this, just a lot more collagen within it, and it's going to look a lot more dense. And then we have what's called elastic cartilage, all right, and elastic cartilage, well, we call it elastic because of its name, okay, or because of, of what it can do. It's elastic. Remember, if you take and bend your ear around or the cartilaginous aspect of your nose, okay, you know, you can apply pressure to it, manipulate its shape, and then the second you relieve the pressure, it goes doink back to its original shape. All right. And elastic cartilage, essentially, you know, you see these chondrocytes. And now notice these long, stringy fibers that are within here. Those are those elastic fibers that I was talking about. All right. And, and remember, these are fibers that you can, if you apply pressure to them, they can mold, they can stretch, and then they can recoil. All right. So that's essentially elastic cartilage. So, I mean, you're really going to find this in the nose and the ears. All right. And then you've got fibrocartilage. Okay, fibrocartilage is, you know, uh, is a very tough type of cartilage. It's a very, very thick, tough, hard rubber, essentially. All right. Now you see the chondrocytes, but you don't see a whole lot of space in between them because all of this space is densely packed with collagen. Okay, a lot of collagen in here. This is not like hyaline cartilage. You know, hyaline cartilage has collagen within the matrix as well, but not as much as fibrocartilage. So hyaline cartilage is tough, but it is rubbery. When we say rubber, you think of stretching. Okay, fibrocartilage is not designed for this. Okay, fi fibrocartilage you find in areas where there's a lot of impact. Okay, where there's a lot of, not impact, but that's a dumb way to say it, not impact, but compressive force okay so areas of the body where there are a lot of compressive forces okay so you see here um, you know these are the intervertebral discs of the vertebrae okay in between the vertebrae I should say all right that I means so this should make sense because you have a lot of body weight compressing these vertebrae now these discs are important because one they prevent the vertebrae from from slamming into each other I mean just from standing up or if you jump around but two these intervertebral discs create spaces called the called foramen that allow nerves to project out of the spinal cord and out to the rest of your body. Okay, so that's also why these discs are important. And if someone has a herniated disc, I'll talk about that in another chapter, but if they have a herniated disc, what happens then is you lose the tough, you know, the, the nice uniform tough arrangement of this, and then that, that foramen, that space becomes smaller and you compress a nerve. All right, so fibrocartilage, the menisci, you know, we are meniscus for singular. Okay, you know, the meniscus are, this is the cartilage you find within your knees. All right, you know, you have a medial and a lateral meniscus. All right, this is a very, very tough, thick, rubbery substance. And in the lab, um, you know, we'll get, a, we'll get a beef knee, and I'll have some, uh, some fibrocartilage for you guys, some menisci to look at. Like I said, it's going to look, it's going to feel like a very, very tough, thick rubber, all right, and, the, and remember, that's a lot of weight coming down on your knees, all right, and then the other major area you find this in is the pubic symphysis, okay, basically, if you look at the, if you look at the, okay, the pelvis, I, that looks more like a thyroid gland, but if you take a look at the, the pelvic area, the, the two anterior bones called the, the pubis, all right, or the, they're called the, the, the pubic bones, sorry, um, they're joined together by this fibrocartilage, all right, and, you know, that's what we call the pubic symphysis. So think of this as an areas of high 
compression, all right? And then you can see, you know, fibro cartilage looks a lot more dense than hyaline cartilage. You saw the, you know, that, hy that hyaline looked a lot more loose in its arrangement, all right, here. So again, collagen in the extracellular matrix, just not as much as the fibro cartilage has. All right, and then with bone, and now these other tissues, this is another supportive tissue in the body, bone. I'm not going to go very in-depth with this just because we have chapters devoted to bone. Um, but bone tissue in general, you know, we mentioned that, it's a, that, that bone has a lot of functions, gives us structure, gives us shape, mineral storage. Now, what you're looking at here is these circles you see that's those are the osteocytes the cells of bone and then all of this in between is the very very tough hard matrix of the cell all right so this would be about the hardest ground substance you're going to find within the body and the reason why it has such a hard ground substance is because of the combination of collagen and calcium okay when you put these two together and then throw water in the mix you form a very very rock solid substance all right and that's essentially bone so the ground substance of bone is essentially mineralized proteins all right and then you have these functional osteocytes hanging around in here as well and then you find these central canals um, within bone so you can see a central canal here and then you see notice how cells um, kind of form a circular arrangement around the central canals that we call perversion canals so and this one circular unit of cells surrounding this canal is what we call an osteon okay and within the central canal are blood vessels and nerves and like i said so then that should make sense as to why the cells arrange themselves around that but like i said i'm not gonna this is as much as i really want to talk about bone tissue just because we have chapters devoted to it and bear in mind that you know this is what we would call compact bone there's another type of bone called spongy bone which i'll mention when we get to the chapter that looks very spongy under the microscope Okay, so it's bone tissue and then blood. Again, blood is just another tissue I'm not going to talk a lot about just because, you know, we have a chapter devoted to blood, but blood is classified as a connective tissue because remember, connective tissue are essentially cells and proteins and, you know, water. You put, you put all that together and you form gels okay blood is not like water blood is a thick sludgy gel okay blood's about five times thicker than water because of all the plasma proteins mixed in it okay and when you take all those plasma proteins okay and there, I mean, it's more than just plasma protein there's other uh solid there's other uh substances within blood that can make it gel like as well but when you take all the proteins and you mix that, you mix that within the, the plasma, okay, the water of blood, okay, you form, you know, like I said, a thick, not a, you form a gel, okay, you form a gel. So, in, so blood is a, is, a, is a sticky gel that circulates around the body. We mentioned the functions of blood before. Blood is used for transportation. Blood is used as, you know, your immune system. We use blood to, you know, form, you know, their cells in there to form clots to control bleeding. All right, this is an example of a white blood cell called the neutrophil that's part of the immune system. These are all erythrocytes, red blood cells, which are primarily used to circulate gases around the body. All right. So again, this is about as much as I want to talk about blood. All right, just because we have a chapter devoted to it. So, so this is so these are the connective tissues and the major properties about them that that you need to know. Next, I want to talk about muscle tissue and nervous tissue. And again, you know, I say this at the end of every video, but I can't, you know, I can't say it enough. If you guys have questions, please don't hesitate to ask.